concessions to Catholics unsettle ascendancy grandees who fear the loss of their power. And in rural Ireland, change creates uncertainty. Catholics and Protestants join sectarian secret societies. The Ireland of the late 18th century swirls with contrary ambitions and ideas. Nothing is settled or inevitable. But the deep fissures in society are about to be exposed. Ireland stands on the verge of cataclysm. Once again, it is events abroad which will provide the spark. In 1789, bloody revolution convulsed France. The king and thousands of his nobles were dispatched to the guillotine in the name of a secular republic. Monarchies and the privileged classes throughout Europe looked on with horror. But the French revolutionary cry of liberty, equality and fraternity inspired a group of idealists in Ireland. What was happening here, the destruction of an imperium, was watched avidly by educated young men in Ireland. Suddenly, the unimaginable became possible. A world of inherited privilege transformed into a society of the free, where reason would overwhelm prejudice. To the revolutionaries of France, it wasn't just the monarchy or the aristocracy, but also the established church that was part of a structure of tyranny that had to be destroyed. In Belfast, these developments were watched with excitement by a group of radicals. They were Presbyterians who now set out to unite all Irishmen in the cause of liberty. They were shaped by revolutionary ideals and the intellectual ferment of the Age of Enlightenment. They produced an alliance that would have seemed unthinkable. Protestant intellectuals from the South, Catholic middle class and the descendants of Ulster planters. It is these Presbyterians who here in Belfast in 1791 found the first organisation dedicated to breaking the link with Britain. They called themselves the United Irishmen and they sought a secular Irish Republic. They allied themselves with the Catholic Committee in peaceful agitation. But events in Europe propelled them from activism to revolution. In 1793, England and France went to war. The pro-French United Irishmen were outlawed. Here at Cave Hill, overlooking Belfast, in June 1795, a group of Irish Protestants gathered to swear an oath. Never to desist in our efforts until we subvert the authority of England over our country and assert our independence. But there is a fundamental crisis. They do not speak for all Protestants. And in rural areas, sectarian clashes between what are called Catholic defenders and Protestants were escalating. The defenders were drawn from the impoverished Catholic peasantry. Rural Ireland is very poor. In the later 18th century, you have secret societies, you have rural gangs of agrarian agitators, you have an underworld, in a sense, of dissent making its feelings felt through violence. Disparate Protestant groups now come together to form an organisation that will be crucial in Ireland's history. The Orange Order. The voice of Protestant fear. But an idealistic young Protestant lawyer from Dublin hoped that even the Orangemen might eventually be won over to the United Irish cause. Theobald Wolfe Tone would become the most articulate proponent of Irish independence. He was very vivacious, very clever. Quite quickly he moves on from the law to become a political pamphleteer. He begins to analyse the wrongs of Ireland and one of the main wrongs was that the vast bulk of the populace was excluded from all political rights, in other words the Catholics. 
As one of the most high-profile United Irishmen, Tone was forced to flee Ireland in the fateful year of 1795. Government plans to give Catholics full political rights had been abandoned under pressure from the Protestant ascendancy. Tone made his way to revolutionary France to seek military help for an Irish revolution. On May the 2nd, 1796, Tone was called to meet the leaders of the French Directory. It's easy to imagine Tone's excitement. This is his moment. From backstreet meetings in Belfast and Dublin, he's come to the centre of international revolution. Walking into the splendour of the Palais de Luxembourg, he said he felt as if it were all a dream. Waiting to greet him was the great military tactician and founder of the revolutionary army, Lazare Carnot. Tone deliberately ignored the sectarian reality in Ireland when he spoke to Carnot. He told him that all the people were unanimous in favour of France and eager to throw off the yoke of England. He asked me then, wrote Tone, what I wanted, an armed force, arms and some money. Tone comes out into the Jardin de Luxembourg outside the, um, the Palais. He's walking around, it's a beautiful summer's evening, listening to music coming out. Um, he's, don't forget, he's been in really high-level discussions, so he's a bit um, um, overwhelmed by them. And then the head of the military bureau comes out and says, it's done, it's agreed. We're sending an invasion force to Ireland. He was a top French general, and Tone just had this moment. I've succeeded. This is what I wanted. Tone's meeting precipitates one of the most dangerous threats to England by revolutionary France. 15,000 French troops in 43 ships arrived off the west coast of Cork in December 1796. With only 11,000 British troops in the area, a French victory looked imminent. Tone came tantalisingly near to his dream of landing a French army in Ireland. We were close enough to toss a biscuit ashore, he said but bad weather and the indecisiveness of commanders scuppered his hopes. The French turned for home. England, he wrote, has had its luckiest escape since the Armada. In Dublin Castle, this aborted invasion sparked panic and a brutal crackdown was ordered. A campaign of terror was carried out by the army and government militias. The crackdown that had happened in Ireland had been rather indiscriminate in that the, the, the forces responsible had treated civilians, ordinary people, as if they were rebels. But by doing that, you had a big influx of Catholics and the United Irishmen were a very different kind of person that had joined the United Irishmen before. The United Irish Army numbered around 100,000 men, inspired both by idealism and desperation. Ireland's revolution was planned for the early summer of 1798. But in May, many of the United Irish leaders were arrested, destroying hopes of a coordinated rebellion. Localised fighting erupted. United Irishmen rose in Kildare, Carlow, Longford, Wicklow, Meath, to the west in Mayo, and to the north in Antrim and Down. The first significant rebel victory was at Owlert in County Wexford, where over a hundred government soldiers were killed. Owlert was quickly followed by the rebel capture of Wexford Town and Enniscorthy. But sectarian fear was deepening. The United Irish include large numbers of Catholic defenders. The Orange Order supports the government. Where the violence breaks out, the question is whose sense of rebellion will predominate? Will it be that of the secular-minded United Irish 
intelligentsia with their French ideas, or will it be that of the, if you like, more deeply rooted, more ancient antipathies that the defenders have kept in their worldview? The sectarian divisions which had been papered over by the United Irishmen's talk of universal brotherhood now exploded into the open. In Ulster, working class and rural Protestants woke to their old fear of overthrow by the Catholics and they rallied to the crown. Militia attacks on civilians helped to heighten sectarianism. In the ranks of the United Irishmen, the ideal of fraternity across the religious divide was fraying. Most of the rebels were tenant farmers and they had inherited a, a long tradition of grievance about Protestant newcomers taking over land, about sectarian conflict, about the new orange order. These were people fighting for themselves. Armed with pikes and some inferior muskets, the rebels at New Ross faced government troops equipped with cannon. The rebels pour down these little streets, take over the middle of the town very quickly, um, but then they come up against gun emplacements. They were simply mown down by grape shot and chain shot. Maybe only 3,000 rebels attacked the town, maybe less. And 1,500 people almost certainly died in 12 hours, which is astonishing. The United Irish Army was inspired both by revolutionary idealism and more local animosities. And as the reality of defeat dawned, hatred would lead some to sectarian massacre. Over 100 Protestant men, women and children were rounded up and locked in a barn at Scullabogue. Once it became clear the battle was going against the rebels, an order came that the barn should be set on fire. There was still maybe up to 100 people in it, crowded into it, and they'd been there for days in sweltering heat. They were told to let nobody escape. Essentially, this group kept the people inside, including women and children, in the barn while they were uh, consumed by flame. One of the United Irish leaders, Miles Byrne, called what happened here at Scullabogue a lamentable disgrace carried out by cowardly ruffians. A rising which started with the ideal of uniting Catholic and Protestant had ended here in sectarian butchery. The rebellion was now entering its final phase. By the end of the summer, 30,000 people were dead. As for Wolf Tone, he was captured on a French boat off the coast of Ireland. Brought to trial in Dublin, Tone began to realise what had been unleashed that summer. It's so poignant and so sad. He says, for, for a fair and open war, I was prepared. That it has disintegrated into mayhem and assassination and bloodshed. I am sincerely sorry. This is not what I had wanted. He was sentenced to death, but cheated the executioner by cutting his own throat. Tone the Martyr would become an icon for future generations of Irish nationalists. But the revolution had ended all hope of uniting Catholic and Protestant.